The Sam and Rose Stein Institute for Research on Aging is committed to advancing lifelong health and well-being through research, professional training, patient care, and community service. As a nonprofit organization at the University of California San Diego School of Medicine, our research and educational outreach activities are made possible by the generosity of private donors. It is our vision that successful aging will be an achievable goal for everyone. To learn more, please visit our website at aging.ucsd.edu. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, this lecture is part of the Stein Public Lecture Series sponsored by the UC San Diego Center for Healthy Aging and the Stein Institute for Research for Aging. And I invite you to visit our website at aging.ucsd.edu to learn more about our programs and research. And today we will have a very special lecture about a very special research project, um, the, twin, uh, the NASA Twin Study. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Brinda Rana, who is the, one of the PI uh, on this study. We are actually very fortunate to have her here tonight because she's only one of 10 researchers in the country who are working on this study. Um, she's an associate professor of psychiatry at UCSD, and she's also an alumna of UCSD. Um, she has deg uh, degrees in mathematics and genetics. Um, she came back to UCSD uh, for her postdoctoral fellowship, and she stayed. And now we're very fortunate to have her here tonight. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Brinda Rana. I'm going to start out with, uh, with a disclaimer here. Many of you know that studies that involve human research involve uh, review and approval by an institutional review board. And the reason for this is to protect the rights of the subjects. And, and the reason I'm going over this is because everybody's very interested in seeing data from my study and our study on the twins. One of the rights that the IRB protects is privacy and confidentiality. And normally when you do a study, you've got a large number of um, participants, hundreds or thousands. So when you provide data in a talk like this, you don't know who the subjects are. But here, <laughs> the entire world knows who the subjects are. <laughs> so I have to be very careful in everything I say is, um, has to be approved by NASA and the two subjects. So the, the, other, the other issue is we're talking about genomic data. Now, probably it doesn't worry Scott and Mark Kelly very much if their genomic data is public, but they have children and their future grandchildren could be affected. So I have to be very careful about the data I disclose today um, and so I will talk about the study and the, the design and, and the whole process. And at the end, I'll give you some of the data that I have been approved to talk about. But if you come back in about half a year, I should have all my data approved for a public presentation. So, so since we're talking about an IRB, I, there's been a lot of I said this study has been a lot of fun because normally when you do research, it's not as high profile and it's maybe you're studying genetics, doing some interventions, diet, exercise. This study has been pretty, uh, pretty involved. So this is the type of letter you get when the IRB approves your study. Usually they either say, okay, this is great, or they send a letter saying, maybe you can make a few changes. This is what the University of California sent to me. They sent to me, this project presents more than the minimal risk to human subjects, <laughs> because we're shooting them out in outer space and doing all sorts of stuff to them. <laughs> 
and their final, their final review was the committee defers to the NASA IRB approval. They just washed their hands to it. So in March 2015, U.S. astronaut Scott Kelly embarked on a one-year mission on board the International Space Station. This became the longest mission that any U.S. astronaut has made. With Russian cosmonaut Koryenko, this became known as the one-year mission. This event alone gave NASA the opportunity to conduct numerous studies to better under understand the physiological changes associated with long-duration space flight and to test the e efficacy of countermeasures against the detrimental effects of space. So the reason why NASA is interested in understanding how long-duration space travel affects um, astronaut health is because they're gearing up for their mission to Mars. So NASA's goal is to send humans to Mars by the 2030s. This will be about a three-year round trip. And before embarking, NASA needs to understand the impact such a mission will have on the human body. For this reason, NASA has begun numerous investigations on human physiology. Well, they've always been doing human physiology. But they've added a new study, and that is to study the molecules in the human body and how the molecules change with space flight. And collectively, the study is, is categorized as molecular omics and systems biology. They're also starting to become very interested in behavioral health and cognition, and also the new field of microbiology in the microbiome. So space flight is a harsh environment. The added effects of zero gravity, confined spaces, circadian disruptions, radiation, dietary limitations, and not to mention isolation from the family may contribute to a number of physiological and psychological manifestations. So previous missions have revealed a number of physiological manifestations. One of the manifestations is known as fluid shifts. So when you're standing on Earth, We've evolved on Earth with 1G gravity. So all the fluids in our body, when we're standing on Earth, flow downward towards the feet. When you lose gravity, when you go up in zero gravity or microgravity conditions, the fluids move from the legs up towards the head and neck and the, and the chest. So I don't know if you remember from childhood, it's been a long time since I did this, but have you ever hung upside down on monkey bars? If you can remember how that feels, you get a, you get a bit of pressure on, the, on your head, or even standing on your head. Now imagine doing that for a whole year, or going to Mars and doing that for three years. So some of the effects that they've observed is facial puffiness in the astronauts. So if you look at photographs of astronauts, you can see that their face is puffy. And this is not because the photography in space is kind of distorted. It's because their faces are getting puffy. They also have increased intracranial pressure. They also suffer from ocular changes and vision problems. They get um, folds in their choroid. They get edema. This causes a number of problems. You probably also remember seeing pictures of astronauts in space. And they're wearing glasses, right? It's not because they have a hard time putting contact lenses on in space, which they probably do, but it's because their eyes or their vision is changing and then they have to wear glasses to um, accommodate for those changes. A lot of these astronauts were pilots, so they, they went in with really good vision and they're going up there and their eyes are changing. So collectively, these symptoms of space flight are known as visual impairment intracranial pressure syndrome, or VIP for short. So this is a major issue that needs to be resolved before astronauts can go up in space. Other issues is a risk for orthostatic intolerance upon landing on Earth. Who saw the landing, Scott Kelly landing back on Earth? Okay, some of you. And do you remember that he didn't just walk out of the space capsule? He was carried out in his whole, his whole chair. Well, there's a number of reasons for that, and one of the reasons is when they land, they are at risk for passing out, for fainting. 
due to this orthostatic intolerance. The other changes are cardiovascular changes. NASA has been observing in their astronauts who are on long duration space flights changes in arterial structure and function. So they're interested in looking at biomarkers for the accelerated progression of these issues that are akin to atherosclerosis. You also have musculoskeletal issues, muscle atrophy, bone con deconditioning. There's no impact because of microgravity. So that's another big issue here. There's cognitive and behavioral issues. The space travel can affect the brain. And they're just, they're, they're starting to do, um, ramp up their studies in, in cognition and behavior. And actually one of our twin studies is looking at this as well. So just to summarize, you've got musculoskeletal decline, accelerated progression for atherosclerosis, cardiovascular issues, possible cognitive decline, vision problems. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> so long duration space travel may cause changes akin to those experienced with aging on Earth. Since these changes are dynamic and faster during space travel, studying astronauts may, may be a good resource for understanding the molecular pathways that are altered in individuals as they age on Earth. And it also can be useful to studying the development of some common diseases. One example of um, an Earth application is um, individuals who are on prolonged bed rest because of illness, they experience muscle atrophy, bone deconditioning, psychosocial decline, and metabolic alterations. Treatments designed for astronauts to counter the similar effects for microgravity might be applied for patients at bed rest who are experiencing similar issues. And in fact, one of the labs that is working as part of our team for the twin astronauts, they've been actually doing quite a lot of work. This is Alan Hargens' lab. We had a Marcella Lee from Channel 8 came over and, and did a whole report on, on the bed rest studies and the astronaut twin studies um, last year. Okay, so the one year's mission provided NASA a unique opportunity to study all these issues. The study became even more interesting because Scott Kelly has a twin brother, Mark, who's also an astronaut. So Mark, unfortunately, had to retire from NASA in 2011 after the last mission of Space Shuttle Endeavor. And this was because his wife, Congresswoman Giffords, uh, survived an assassination attempt, but that left her um, physically impa impaired. So he retired and was grounded. So, but because of this, we have um, Scott Kelly was still flying, and this provided a really unique environment to study what space does to the human body while controlling for the effects of genes. So this is the whole nature versus nurture. Previously, studies such as this were being, or are still being done on genetically identical mice, or flies, or genetically identical plants. This is actually great. We can actually, ha we have genetically identical humans now that we can study. So NASA reached out to the scientific community they wanted to study omics, which I'll explain a little bit further in the next slide. And omics, they created this great poster for us, a journey to see even more than ever before. So the idea was to do an integrated omics study of the human body during space travel. So omics incorporates a number of different studies, number of different fields from genomics, epigenomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, and the emerging field, the microbiome. So for example, something like proteomics that relates to proteins, metabolomics relates to metabolites. So the definition is that omics is the collective characterization and quantification of pools of these biological molecules in a give, at a given time. So take a sample from, a, from an individual or, or a cell, and you quantify all the proteins 
that are in that cell tissue sample at that point in time. And the idea was to do, look at all the different molecules there are out there and work together to integrate all that information and see how together our body, the pathways that make our body function the way they do change due to space flight. So they put out a call and they chose 10 studies. UCSD was chosen as one of the studies and I have the great fortune of leading one of the 10 studies. So the sites were chosen all over the United States. Um, UCSD, Stanford, Colorado, Cornell, Northwestern in Illinois, Johns Hopkins, and also NASA. These are the twin investigators and some of the NASA officials, all of us working together. At UCSD, we have a team of PIs and postdocs and students all working together. So included in our team, you, you may have seen some of these talks. I think Alan Hargens has given a talk here. Kumar Sharma, Hemal Patel, Vivian Hook, Dorothy Sears, and then Brandon Macias was here, but he actually got recruited and moved to, to NASA ha um, halfway through our study. Okay, so this is the hypothesis of the study. The hypothesis is that given that Mark and Scott Kelly are identical twins, their DNA will be identical. But the stressors of space flight, which Scott Kelly will experience, will perturb the regulatory mechanisms of the genome. So the regulatory mechanisms of the genome include epigenetic pathways, pathways that regulate how genes are expressed. And this, in turn, will affect the way proteins are expressed, the way immune function is regulated, metabolites, how we metabolize what we eat, and also it'll change all the little organisms that live in and on our body that keep us healthy, and these are known as the microbiome. And under each of these fields is a name, and these are the names of the investigators that are involved. So when, when all these changes occur, these changes will then affect the physiology of the body, in particular, the way our brain works and our vasculature, some, some of what I explained earlier in the beginning of the talk. Now, people like to remind me that this is a study of n equals 2. We do know that. And with a study of n equals 2, we can't do the sophisticated statistical studies that you find in these big genomic studies with thousands and thousands and thousands of subjects. But what we can do is we can look for clues in pathways that are changing. So what the design is, is to look at a, the trajectory of changes. So we're sampling pools of biofluids from the two astronauts over the course of two years. For example, the green line is Scott Kelly. So this is hypothetical. So pre-flight, he might have a certain profile in his proteins, his metabolites, his gene expression. When he takes off, that takeoff may create some sort of a change in his uh, physiology and the profile of, of whatever molecule we're looking at. So the idea is to capture the relationship of positive and negative physiological events in relation to these molecular changes. And then we have his brother, who's just, he's going to stay at home living a normal astronaut retired life. He is definitely not a normal 54-year-old person. Throughout our study, he is, we had to track him down to get samples because he's been on, he's been on the road um, lobbying for gun control because of what happened to his wife. So sometimes he's in New York, sometimes he's in Arizona. Wherever he is, one of us flies there and, and gets samples from him. So we had his longitudinal sampling design. So we got samples from everything we could possibly get. So we got saliva samples for the cells in the mouth, and that was used to sequence their entire DNA sequence, so their, all their genes. Um, to look at epigenetics, we got urine to look at proteins and metabolites, blood for all of the studies, actually. And um, we got 
poop. We got the stool sample to study the microbiome. So we're all molecular biologists. So molecular biologists, for the most part, are used to working on Earth with subjects. And when you're a study participant, you give a vial of blood, and it's used for that research. Sometimes you give one, two, three, four, five, six, six vials of blood. And that's what we're used to. We're used to getting maybe five vials of blood to do whatever we want with doing our genetic studies or our metabolomic studies. Well, that's what we all went in thinking we were going to get. NASA said, no. The 10 of you are going to get one vial of blood, and you're going to figure out how to share this one vial of blood to do everything you need to do. So they put us in a room. This was the first day we met. Most of us, we didn't know each other. Some of them had worked with each other. They put us in a room for a whole day and had us hash out how we were going to cooperate and share this one vial of blood for every time point. Now, it's not because they're stingy. It's because we weren't the only study we found out. There were so many other studies. I don't even know the number of studies the astronauts are involved in. And those other studies wanted their blood, too. And there's only so much blood a human being can give on a given day. And on top of that, it's not like when you do a give blood here where you go into a clinic and you have a nice phlebotomist who takes your blood and puts a nice Band-Aid on and sends you on your way. They got to do it to themselves in space while they're floating around and everything is floating around. And then their favorite thing to do is collect urine. This is the toilet basically in space. You can see right here, it's got a little vacuum, so you gotta pee in that. Then to collect urine for us, they gotta pee in that and then put a little valve in and collect the pee for us. So if that pee doesn't go in and it starts floating around, it, it becomes airborne in this space station. They read us a quote on the first day, a paragraph of what an astronaut goes through. It was written by one of the astronauts. I think it took him 45 minutes to collect pee for, for a study. So they really don't like doing that. So Mark and Scott Kelly were featured in Time, and this is what he said about collecting fecal samples. And this is, this is, okay, this is how I, you're supposed to remember Scott and Mark. Scott went to space. Mark has a mustache. So Mark's the one who stayed on the ground, and. He was very cynical about this whole poop collection thing. Actually, I, I should have mentioned it on, I, on the thank you slide, but Mark lives in Tucson. And we actually had um, one of our UCSD investigators, I think a member of, of the Center for LV Aging, also Jason Yuan. He's um, now moved to Tucson. And so when we were doing the study, we gave him a call and said, hey, can, can we use your lab for, for everything we do on, on um, Scott Kelly, I mean, on Mark Kelly when we collect samples, and he was really great. So we did all, all the, whenever Mark was at home, we did all the collections and, and sample processing in his lab. So year one, we had to figure out, the way we worked is we talked on the phone for an hour and a half every week to figure out for a year before Scott Kelly went to the International Space Station. We had to figure out a way not only to collect samples, share samples, develop protocols for sharing samples, but also develop protocols for collecting the samples in space. This, this wasn't easy because everything that goes up, you can't use the regular glass vials that we do here because if that shatters, that goes airborne and that's just floating around as like little s spikes in the space station. So everything has to be certified. So we came up with this, this scheme. So there are two shuttles. There's the SpaceX and the Russian Soyuz that goes up regularly. The Russian Soyuz goes up with their astronaut, with the astronauts. They trade them off in the space station. They bring them supplies. They bring down um, samples. And then there's SpaceX that goes up with supplies for for the U.S. So, which which one do you think is more reliable, SpaceX or 
or uh, Soyuz. Soyuz is more reliable. So we decided, they, they told us that this up front, they said, when you need the samples down there within 24 hours to do your assay, you have to time the blood collection with the Russian Soyuz um, transport. So we did, for some of the assays, such as RNA and the telomere studies and the telomerase a, um, assays, we needed the blood right away. So two days before, before the Soyuz was scheduled to come, we get the blood drawn from the astronaut. The blood, the Soyuz would come land in Kazakhstan. Our NASA people would be around, I think with their helicopters looking for where it landed. They'd go in, they'd grab our samples, they'd ship it over to Houston. The Houston lab, Scott Smith's lab, would then distribute it to the labs around, around the country that needed those samples and then we would do our assays right away. For other samples that we were gonna, we, it wasn't that strict, they actually have a freezer up in space, it's pretty cold. So we had a, basically a minus 80 freezer up there, minus 80 Celsius. So for a lot of my studies, we kept the sample stored in space. And as, after the, uh, after the one year mission, slowly the samples came down. Um, Scott Kelly brought one batch of samples with them, but all the other samples came down later. And then the supplies went up routinely because s our supplies, they don't always have a one, one year shelf life. Some of them have a six, maybe a six month shelf life. So we had to figure out what supplies needed to go when. So it was, it was a pretty interesting process because these are things that you do think about it when you're doing a study on Earth, but you really had to think about it when, when we were doing this study. So have you all seen one of these movies? Okay, well, things don't always go the way they're supposed to. So we did lose a supply ship or two. Um, I think uh, sometime in June when, in 2015 when, uh, when SpaceX blew up, so did our supplies. But the great thing about NASA is they send you really nice letters. <laughs> I mean, look at this letter. It says, as astronaut Scott Kelly tweeted on Sunday, space is hard. They go on to say, speaking as a fellow researcher, I can only imagine how devastated you must be feeling right now. And then they go on to say, hang in there. We're going to do whatever we need to do to help you out. Just keep going. I do studies for a lot of different grant agencies, like the National Institute of Health. If your experiment doesn't work for NIH, I, I don't think they would send you a letter <laughs> like this encouraging you. They'd just say, okay, well, we'll take away your money now. <laughs> so um, we persevered, and we got our samples. So I was, I was after the urine. I was like, after all that stuff with the blood, I was like, let's focus on the urine. So we really developed our u urine protocols here. A little bit more abundant, even though the astronauts seem to think it's harder to collect. We ended up, all these little urine vials, this is the Earth twin, this is the space twin. We actually managed to get more urine from, this, from the space twin than we did from the ground twin. <laughs> and the same for the blood. So we got quite a bit of samples to do a really good study of how space changes the molecules in the body. Now, not only was the study, th this is actually, NASA tells us, this is very pioneering, a pioneering study. NASA has, not, has never done an, an omics study before. So they also used this study to develop the protocols, the procedures that were needed to do genomics on, in space. So this study has opened the door for us to continue studies and do more studies on a larger population of astronauts so that instead of having just an N of two, we can increase our, our sample size in the future. Okay, so UCSD, we have one study, the one that had my name on it, and a second study that we actually wrote the grants together 
we were going to write one huge grant and it was just too much so we decided let's just break it up and have two different people apply for it and we ended up getting both so that's why we have actually two studies so our study is designed to investigate the relationship between omics signatures and long duration space physiological adaptations so we're looking at two adaptations one is fluid shifts and VIP, which I explained earlier, the, the process in which the fluids go upwards when you're in microgravity. And the other is the cardiovascular dysfunction due to oxidative stress and inflammation that may be caused by spaceflight environment, all the stressors, including radiation. So we had to collect the data. So that's, that's not a trivial matter either. So we wanted to look at the arterial structure here. So the way you do that in your doctor's office is with an ultrasound. They generally have to do it to themselves. So the cardiovascular lab at NASA has designed this really neat method. So they've got a computer. I got to, I got to do this. They, they had me do a whole ultrasound on myself, too. Um, and everything's color-coded, all the boards. So they, they, the astronaut holds the, the little probe up to their artery. Our staff is here at, at ground control, talking them through everything and say, OK, hit pink button A, or hit green button B, whatever it is. And they guide them through the entire process. Everything's color-coded and lettered, make, making it so easy for them. And they say, OK, stop here, get the picture. So when I was there, I noticed that right there in mission control where the person who was guiding the ultrasound on the astronauts, there are all these little balls, these little toy balls. I mean, it was full of them. It was like, are you collecting these? You know, what's, what are these for? They said, no. The reason we have them is there's a five second delay between mission control and the space station. So when the astronaut gets that perfect picture and they say, OK, stop. In that five second delay, they move their hand and they lose the image. And so every time that happens, that frustrates them and they throw the ball against the wall. <laughs> <laughs> so the next was the, li this, the fluid shifts. Now, this is a <laughs> diagram that was put together by Eric Hoagland, who is one of the team members who does all the physiology for the fluid shifts that's working with us. The detail is not important. What, what I wanted to show you on this slide is, if you see this list, and these are the time points, like L minus 18, L minus 12, that means launch 18 months before launch, 12 months before launch. So all the pre-flights. These are all the physiological measures our study did on Scott Kelly. Before he went, when he was in flight, and post-flight. And while he's getting all these measures done, Mark is being flown to Houston and getting similar tests done. So these include MRI imaging, uh, vision tests, vision imaging, um, studying how water is compartmentalized in the body, lots of different measures. So they're going through a lot. And and we, and we have to keep remembering that this, they're involved in like maybe 50 studies, so we're not the only ones studying them. So that, that was something that was kind of eye-opening, that they're constantly being tested every day, or they're doing something. It's, it's not that they're just up in space, you know, running the spaceship. OK, so what we're doing here at UCSD is we're working to link the physiology with the omics. So our focus at UCSD are the metabolites and the peptides. So we're using some sophisticated techniques here at UCSD, mass spectrometry, to look at the populations of proteins in the plasma or the urine at each time point. Similarly for the metabolomics. And then we're also doing a study we're looking at the metabolic phenotype of the cells. So we're looking at how the profiles of proteins, metabolites, and other compounds in the plasma and the urine can drive the energetics of a cell. So 
we're going to go back to kind of DNA basics. So when we look at the proteins, proteins include hormones, enzymes. They also in include structural molecules that help transport water, for, that's a, for example. So if we see changes in proteins, this is an integrated study. We're not going to stop there. Now, the DNA molecule, is, it's a recipe book. What it does is it tells us the proteins that are going to be coded. So the way it works is DNA is um, transcribed into a molecule called RNA. And then the RNA is translated into a protein. So if we see a change in the protein, we're also interested in looking at all the other data that we have and seeing, well, here's a change in a particular protein due to spaceflight. Do we see a change in the RNA molecule as well? And or do we see a change in the mechanisms that are regulating this DNA to RNA? So this is what we mean by integration. So we're, we're not just looking at one endpoint. We're looking at the pattern of everything, the genes, the RNA, the proteins, the metabolites. OK, so here, here's another for example. So this is a basic glycolysis pathway. When we eat something, it gets metabolized. So this is the process of metabolism of glucose. Okay. So what I mean by metabolites are these are all the intermediate molecules in the pathway that metabolizes glucose. So eventually, what, what you eat, or glucose, turns into ATP, which is the energy currency of the cell. So, but along the way, you get what are called metabolites, little metabolites right here. The metabolism occurs through these proteins that are enzymes. So you got these enzymes working away, changing glucose to this G6P, all the way down these different intermediate metabolites to pyruvate. So the question would be is, suppose during space flight, you saw that this metabolism is shunted either one way or the other, like towards pyruvate or lactate. What we're interested in doing is, OK, that's interesting that's happening, and that might be causing some physiological effects. But we're also interested in seeing how it's regulated by the genome. How is that happening? So for example, we can look at the transcriptomics, the gene expression data. Perhaps the gene that's regulating the change from pyruvate to lactate or pyruvate to acetyl-CoA Perhaps there is a change in the expression pattern of this particular gene that codes for the protein. So we're in the process right now is each of the individual labs have generated their data. So I've generated all the data on the proteins and the metabolites that are, that are changing. Now what we're trying to do is seeing what is causing these changes. And so, so we're seeing some interesting patterns, which I can't tell you for the reason I explained earlier, of changes in metabolic pathways, changes in metabolites that are occurring in association with space travel. And we're seeing gene expression changes in the enzymes that regulate these pathways. So in about half a year, we'll be able to publicly show all those pathways that are being perturbed by the space travel. And the integration, the person who's leading the integration is Mike Snyder. He's at Stanford, and he, in 2012, did a similar study on himself. He's a very interesting guy. He walks around with all sorts of gadgets all over him. He's constantly measuring himself, <laughs> spinning in a tube or doing whatever he needs to do. So he did this study on himself, and he published his study of everything that we're doing on the, on the twin astronauts, genomics, transgenomics, proteomics, metabolomics. And he looked at himself, I think it was a, a course of a year. And he also, which was very interesting, is he captured, he was, he was normal healthy when he started the project. He developed diabetes during the project. He captured 
the, the whole pathway that caused him to have diabetes, and it was due to actually an in infection. So it's a very interesting paper. It's just very, it's not easy reading. <laughs> okay, so our preliminary findings, so these are the findings that have been approved by NASA for, for public viewing. So it's not surprising that after a year in space, there were ocular changes in Scott Kelly that were not found in Mark Kelly. He had some structural changes, some folds in his eye. They're, they're monitoring them now long term to see if it will go back to normal or not, because that's also important because you want your astronauts to, you know, these are really healthy people. You don't want them coming back blind or with vision impairment. Um, the other item that was C-reactive protein, proteins. So this is a marker for inflammation, and it's often done in a medical test, right? So soon after landing, there appeared to be a spike in the C-reactive protein in Scott Kelly. Now we're getting all the data together to see how that was related to any physiological changes. Um, this is just, uh, just between Scott and Mark Kelly. Now this, this doesn't have necessarily have to do with space travel. This is just in general. They found that even though they're identical twins, 200,000 RNA molecules were differentially expressed in the twins. So even though you're identical, um, the environment can win out. Um, another thing that was identified was this IGF-1 hormone. They found this, uh, we found this hormone level increased um, over the year, and this was found by, um, I believe it's Scott Smith's lab, in what he, he's one of the 10 investigators. So this hormone is interesting. It's implicated in bone and muscle health, and it's usually high during puberty, and then as you age, it goes down. And this is probably due to a, a countermeasure. So one of the countermeasures that they're implementing on astronauts is, is um, heavy exercise. This is to keep them from having bone loss and muscle loss. So this is a regiment that they, Scott Kelly was under. And so probably this increase in this hormone is related to this exercise. So that's actually an interesting finding that, well, the exercise is affecting this hormone, which then helps with bone health and muscle health. Um, the other thing that they identified was um, we have a number of bacterial groups that live in our gut. Um, and there's different ratios of these bacteria. So what they found, they found in Scott Kelly was that during space flight, the ratio of two of the major groups of bacteria, the Firmicutes and the Bacterioides, they flipped. And then when they returned back to when he returned back to Earth, it flipped back to what it was previously. So the the gut microbiome, you, you're probably aware of this. It's important for our health. And so that would be an interesting finding for also the nutrition group to see that, well, is it does it have to do with maybe the astronaut diet? What I, so our group is working with the telomeres and the telomerase. So there's two groups working. The primary group is Susan Bailey at, the, at Colorado State. And then our group also with um, DeVivo's lab at Harvard is looking at telomeres. So both our groups use different assays and using two different assays, we came up with the same results. And that's pretty important. And so what, what we found is telomeres, which they're, they're caps on the tips of the chromosomes. And they, these, these caps decrease as we age. And eventually, when you lose the caps, you get cell death. So you like to have longer telomere length. Um, so we found some changes in telomere length that we're trying to understand in relation to the physiology. And I can't quite give you the data, unfortunately. Um, but there was also another interesting thing. Telomerase, which is an enzyme 
Now this enzyme lengthen, lengthens telomeres, so it's a good thing when it's really active. About 180 days after landing, we collected blood samples on both Mark and Scott Kelly. They both had a spike in the activity of their telomerase. We actually, then we didn't really know why this was, but we found out that it was related just, just uh, not too long before the blood was collected, their father had died. So it was probably related to the stress of the death. So it's kind of interesting that this life stress caused an increase in telomerase activity, which then kind of gives the chromosomes a protective role by increasing telomere length. Um, that, that's, this is all preliminary data, so we have to figure out, investigate more. So in conclusion, the NASA twin study was designed to provide clues on how the body adapts at the molecular and physiological level to long-term space flight. So we've managed to capture the relationship of positive and negative physiological events in relation to molecular changes and life events in space. But by doing this study with our c ground control, we've also found some interesting, like as for example, the telomerase, from interesting changes that happen on everyday life on Earth in the relationship of molecular changes. So a study like this, with this intense physiology and molecular characterization, as far as we know, has not yet been done. So not only are we looking at the unique astronaut space travel, we've also got really good data on a human on Earth and how over the course of two years, molecules change. So we want to expand our study. Well, we can expand it to more, more astronauts, but there aren't also that many astronauts. So we continue our studies with what's called ground analog studies. So ground analog studies include a study known as a head down tilt bed rest. So when you're at rest, you, you have some of the same physiological effects of zero gravity, but they're not getting that same effect in space. You're not getting that pressure in the head. So what they do is they do this tilt, the six degree, 15 degree tilt, where the, then you can get that effect, uh, that um, pressure in the head and, and the fluids going downward. So I'm involved in a couple of these studies. I have two other grants um, to study omics in bed rest subjects. So these bed rest studies, are, they're not just done for an hour. These are people who are at bed rest. One of the studies, the people are going to be at bed rest for 30 days with their head tilted like that. And while they're like this, we're going to do 24-hour urine pools and plasma samples and do exactly similar studies that I showed you on metabolites and proteins. The other study was a 70-day head down tilt. It was already done, and they've collected the samples. It's, they're now in my freezer. Um, they just sent me an email about a couple of weeks ago, and they said, don't do anything with it yet, because the budget's not, I guess we, they're waiting for Congress to actually send them the money that they told me I had. So Earth applications are, as I said before, results from this ex uh, the, these experiments will allow us to better understand factors that influence aging-related disorders and develop treatments for conditions that are similar to those associated with long-duration space flight. So some of the examples are glaucoma, bed rest, um, associated issues, traumatic brain injuries, cardiovascular disease. And we've got a huge group of investigators at UCSD, and this does not even include all the people at NASA actually getting things done, all the technicians and, and the people who are talking to the astronauts. 
every day. This is a huge study. So I just gave this talk, not this exact talk, but a talk about the twin astronauts to um, Hoover High School students. So out in City Heights um, yesterday. So when I did that, I, the reason was to inspire them to go into science or, or you know, just go to college and tell them how much fun it is to be a scientist. So I put together a bunch of pictures and showed them how much fun we have at NASA. And I have to say that this is just working it with NASA has been a lot of fun. So I'm, I'm just going to show you some of the fun things that we, we've done that, that's unique to working with NASA. So I go to Johnson Space Center three or four times a year. So one of the first things they did when, uh, when they got us all together in 2014 was you got to come up with a study name and a patch. We got to come up with a patch. I'm like, a patch? I'm like, I've done studies for years at UCSD. No one's asked me to come up with a patch for my study. Well, apparently, the astronauts, for every study they're involved in, they wear a patch. This has been going on since the Apollo years. And you can see here that they wear the patch at the end of the mission and study. The patch is ceremoniously put on the wall at mission control. So we had to come up with a patch. And even the latrine, even the toilet has a patch. <laughs> so if the toilet has a patch, we have to have a patch. So the first thing is we got to have a name. So of course, you know, everybody wants Gemini, but unfortunately, Gemini was taken. So we came up with some ideas, Skywalker study, because Luke and Princess Leia were twins, but weren't sure if George Lucas would go for that. Um, came up with some twins from mythology. They were just too complicated. So in the end, we came up with the NASA twin study. And believe it or not, every single one of us had input, all 10, 10 sites, not just the investigators, 10 sites in their labs, one of their little molecules in this patch. <laughs> and we got it done. And these are the names of all the, the institutions. And UCSD got nicely put right in the middle because it's alphabetical. <laughs> so the other, the other fun thing was, well, you watch these movies. And you get the impression that NASA is like really cool and in the future and just like an amazing place to visit. And it is. But when you go in, you got to remember it's just a federal, it's a federal building. <laughs> and I got to tell you, my high school kids, they were so excited to see these floors because this is exactly the same floors they had in their classroom. <laughs> So that was very enlightening to see that they're out in their little huts and their trailers just like we are for our studies here. And then they treat us super well. Every time we go, they, they organize really fun stuff, field trips around. This is all the investigators having lots of margaritas. And, and they put together a little collage for us. And we get to do really fun things, little outreach things. So we did this event called Reddit. And it's an online thing that for two hours, people all over the world can ask you anything they want online. And you get together. So, so about eight of us got together. We're all on the phone together, just constantly answering questions. Because there were like thousands of questions coming our way. And we were just like, OK, Chris, you take this. Brenda, you take this. And we're just answering everybody's questions. And that was. Exhausting, but a lot of fun. And then the celebrity status, they really, they really, this is a high profile study and they make us feel like we're like really special. So we've been on TV, I've got to meet all sorts of cool people. But I think one of the coolest things I got to do was at, at UCSD graduation, I got to sit on stage with one of the newest astronauts, Kate Rubens, who's the first astronaut who. Um, sequenced DNA in space. She's actually a graduate of UCSD. And then my friend was at the Reuben H. Fleet Theater with her son, and she said, 
did you know you have an exhibit at, at Reuben H. Fleet? <laughs> like, no? <laughs> so, and then I get, got a nice little autographed Time magazine from Scott Kelly, who misspelled my name. <laughs> and, and one of the greatest things about this is I've got to work with amazing scientists, both at UCSD and the scientists that I'm working with in the project, the, the 10 investigators. Um, these are top genomic researchers in the United States. But here at UCSD and on, on the teams that I'm working with, this is my co-investigator who runs all the physiology for, uh, for, for our UCSD study. I got an email that he received the Silver Snoopy Award from him. This was, uh, I think, about a year and a half ago. And I'm like, OK. I'm like, are you serious? And then I looked it up on Wikipedia. And this is like a, like a really big honor from NASA to get the Silver Sno Snoopy Award. So I don't, I don't know. It's like, uh, it's like the NASA Nobel Prize. I don't know. But it's a, it's, a, it's a really good honor. And he got it. And so I'm just really proud that I got to work with, with Mike Stenger. And then Alan Hargens, who um, as a mentor, got me involved in this particular NASA twin study. He just last month received the highest honor that NASA gives. Um, and here he is receiving his certificate. So it's just been great working with everyone. And just wanted to thank the researchers who are on my team for the particular study. So these are the original investigators. It's uh, when we put the grant in, and it's it's growing. We, we're we're calling in more and more experts as the data comes in, because we've got a ton of data that we're trying to understand. So, thanks. <laughs>